Hey everybody. So I have a fairly significant guest. Alan Dershowitz probably needs not much of an introduction. Professor Emeritus at Harvard Law, long-standing legal commentator, and I asked him to come on to discuss Robert Mueller's statement on Wednesday, which was obviously designed to instigate impeachment. So we discussed a variety of legal issues related to that, and he initially said that he had 20 minutes to do the podcast, and I managed to extend it to around 38, so no, did not get to ask him about every issue under the sun, but he said he'd be willing to come back on at a later time, and we can you know, revisit various subjects. I don't agree with him on many things, and I stated as such over the course of this discussion, and I you know, probed him on different matters as well. So listen for yourself, I suppose, and here we go. All right, Alan Dershowitz, thank you for doing this. My pleasure. So Robert Mueller came out with a statement yesterday that you reacted quite strongly to in a column in The Hill, and I want to get to that, but quickly first, if you look at the best-selling books in America right now, at least nonfiction books, one of them is a copy of the Mueller Report to which you provided an introduction, and I have to admit, I find it a little odd because the Mueller Report is a publicly available document. Anybody with an internet connection can access it, and yes, yet these books are selling like hotcakes. How do you interpret that? I was surprised also. I mean, I wrote an introduction. Obviously, I have a point of view, and I have a group of people who support my point of view. If you go on Amazon, the reviews of my book are either one star the worst or five stars the best, almost nothing in the middle, because most people haven't even read my introduction. They either like me or what I've said up to now and give me five stars, or they hate me and what I've said up to now and they give me one star. So I think buying these Mueller reports is a way of voting. Uh, If you are voting against the Mueller report, you buy my book. If you're voting in favor of the Mueller report, you buy the Washington Post. And uh, so I I doubt very many people who have bought these books have actually read the report from beginning to end. I think they've read the introductions, but um, I doubt very many people have read the 400 and some odd pages, some of which are, are quite tedious. But it's an important historical record. It doesn't justify the appointment of a special counsel. Special counsel are not supposed to be there for history. They're supposed to be there to decide whether to indict or not indict. And I think the Mueller investigation proves that uh, special counsel are uh, not consistent with our constitutional system and the rule of law. And I hope this case marks the end special counsel rather than new special counsel picked by you know, Democrats to get Republicans, Republicans to get Democrats. I hope we're seeing an end to the special counsel, just like a few years ago we saw an end to the special prosecutor law. Do you see any ethical quandary in commercial publishing outfits repurposing a public governmental document and then selling it on the market? And again, I'm not saying it's straightforwardly unethical or anything like that, but it has occurred to me that there's a little weirdness there. It's done all the time, and it's part of the marketplace of ideas. Uh, you can go online and get it for free, and people should do that. But if people want to read my introduction, they have to pay, what, I don't know, $8 or something like that to get my version of it or the Washington Post version or the other versions. Uh, That happens repeatedly. The the Star Report, the same thing. I did an introduction to the Star Report years ago. Um, Many, many reports by the government have been commercially produced. Obviously, the um, Warren Commission report, many others. So, part of American free market society. You can you can publish for profit anything that the government publishes. The government has no copyright or trademark on anything they publish. Fair enough. So, so you published a book last year in which you made the case against impeachment. And I'm just curious, as a thought exercise, what could you come up with as the steel man case for impeachments, which is to say the most persuasive possible case that could be available to Democrats, even if you don't yourself agree with it? Well, it's a fair question. I would look for, there are two precedents. 
One is Richard Nixon. And if you can find anything that's parallel to what Richard Nixon did, those are grounds for impeachment. Richard Nixon um, uh, paid hush money to witnesses who might have testified in federal cases. Against him, he told his subordinates to lie, and he destroyed evidence. If Trump did any of those things, it would be an obstruction of justice. And obstruction of justice is a high crime and misdemeanor if committed while in office. So I do believe that if they could come up with hard evidence of obstruction of justice, that would be an impeachable offense. The other precedent is George H.W. Bush. He pardoned Casper Weinberger and a handful of other people on the eve of their trial in order to stop the investigation of Iran-Contra by um, the special prosecutor in that case. And the special prosecutor said he did it to stop the investigation. And yet nobody suggested or implied or even thought about um, uh, charging uh, President Bush with obstruction of justice because you can't charge a president with obstruction for simply engaging in constitutionally protected activities under Article 2. And those activities include pardoning. They also include firing. So to the extent Mueller, in his report, suggested that you could indict a president for obstruction of justice for firing um, the head of the FBI or for firing Mueller if he had done that, they're just wrong as a matter of constitutional law. So those are the two precedents, Nixon and, and, and Bush. And I think this case comes a lot closer to Bush than it does to Nixon. Ken Starr did accuse Bill Clinton of witness tampering mm-hmm. and other obstructive acts. So why would that not also serve as a precedent? Well, he didn't indict him. Uh, all he did is charge him and refer 11 counts, I think it was, um, to the House of Representatives for impeachment, which they then did. Uh, it backfired. Uh, but uh, Starr saw his mission as not charging the president, but instead uh, giving a roadmap to Congress uh, to impeach. And that's what they did. And he did find crimes. Um, and he found crimes committed, he said, by the president while he was president. But uh, again, uh, according to at least Mueller, the Constitution would forbid uh, indicting or prosecuting a president while he's in office. It wouldn't prevent indicting and prosecuting a president after he leaves office, either by way of impeachment or by being defeated for re-election or after his term is over. Of course, after his second term is over, the statute of limitations would probably have expired on most of the alleged crimes. So in this column that you published at The Hill, your perhaps most vociferous reaction is um, in, prompted by this bizarre statement from Mueller, quote, if we had confidence that the president clearly did not commit a crime, we would have said so. And when I heard that, yeah. I had to double check and read the transcript because I almost couldn't Me believe too. what I was hearing. Because I've never, I, I don't think I've ever heard more wildly fallacious reasoning from a prosecutor. Uh, me too, and especially a prosecutor who was aware that everybody in the country virtually attacked Comey for doing essentially the same thing. Comey said, I'm not going to indict Hillary Clinton, but I'm going to criticize her for extreme carelessness. And everybody said that was wrong. The prosecutor should never go beyond saying, I'm not going to indict. And here you have this special counsel uh, going well beyond it and implying that uh, he might be guilty. And then in subsequent paragraphs, he says, he implies that maybe he would have indicted him had it not been for the Justice Department rule and the constitutional prohibition against indicting or charging or prosecuting a sitting president. So he certainly put his thumb, as I put it in my column yesterday, his elbow on the scale in favor of impeaching uh, President Trump, which is, I think, not the proper role of a prosecutor, whether he be a special counsel or an ordinary prosecutor. In essence, what Mueller is asserting is that he views it as the proper remit of a prosecutor to not prove a crime, but to prove the absence of a crime. How is that possibly a workable standard? It's not, obviously, um, and our burden of proof, unlike in the Soviet Union, where everything you did was a crime unless there's a specific uh, statute that says that what you did is legal. Uh, Everything is illegal except if it's uh, statutorily legal. In the United States, we have the opposite rule. Uh, You're innocent until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. We have a strong presumption of innocence, and he did two things. One, he reversed the presumption of innocence, but second, he suggested that it's the role of the prosecutor to decide whether people are guilty or innocent. It's not. Prosecutors only decide whether there's sufficient evidence to meet the probable cause standard 
for bringing a person to trial. It's the trial itself which determines guilt or innocence based on cross-examination, zealous defense, uh, exculpatory evidence, Brady evidence, a whole range of issues, and proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And so he confused his role with that of fact finder. He also did it when he talked about the indictment against the Russians, who could never be brought to trial. He described the indictment as if it were a conviction, and as if the allegations in the indictment should be taken as true. We don't know whether they're true or not. I suspect they are. But uh, the rule of law doesn't permit a prosecutor to say that uh, this indictment proves anything. It doesn't prove anything. An indictment is simply a charging instrument, not evidence of guilt. Mueller's statement seems to be a continuation of this trend where prosecutors, despite not bringing charges against political figures, seem entitled to go out in public and pronounce on the conduct of those figures. So you mentioned Comey as an example. There was another example, actually, in 2017 when Bill de Blasio, the mayor of New York City and current presidential candidate, was under federal and state investigations. And both state and federal prosecutors collaborated to opine on de Blasio's conduct while not bringing charges. Mm-hmm. They said that they were hamstrung by the Supreme Court case that vacated yeah. the conviction of Bob McDonald. But is, is this is this just a trend that pertains to high-profile political figures, or should we be concerned that it actually is more pervasive and could impinge on people of less stature? Well, we should be concerned. Um, going after celebrities in this way goes back a long time. I was Mia Farrow's uh, lawyer uh, when she and Woody Allen uh, went after each other. And you may remember that the state attorney in Connecticut reviewed all the evidence against Woody Allen and came to the conclusion that there was insufficient evidence to prosecute him for any improper conduct in relation to Mia Farrow's daughter. Nonetheless, he went out of his way to suggest uh, that maybe there was um, uh, some possibility that he might be guilty. And that was a mistake back then. So I think we've seen this violation of prosecutorial norms over many years, most particularly when it comes to high profile people. But I think it's probably happening as well when it comes to ordinary folks. And we have to put a stop to it because prosecutors are in a position, are not in a position to opine on guilt or innocence because they don't hear exculpatory evidence. Their witnesses are not cross-examined. Their credibility is not challenged. Uh, There is no opportunity to see um, uh, Brady information or other information that may prove exculpatory. So that's why we have trials. Prosecutors are not the trial, you know, the jury and judge and executioner. They are just the prosecutors. And they have no more credibility than a defense attorney does when a defense attorney gets up in court and says not guilty. So you have a prosecutor getting up and saying there's sufficient evidence to prosecute. The defense attorney says not guilty. We shouldn't believe either of them. We should say, let's wait and see, let's hear a trial, let's hear the evidence, and then we can decide, and a jury and a judge should decide whether or not the subject of the investigation is guilty or not guilty. I think we're moving away from that. I think the Me Too movement has moved away from that. If a person is charged under the Me Too movement, that person is presumed guilty, no matter what the evidence is. I wrote an article in the Wall Street Journal some time ago demanding that I be investigated by the FBI because I was falsely charged by a woman who I never met, never saw, never heard of. And the only way to prove my innocence was to have an FBI investigation of me and her. And so I've spoken to the FBI about that and sought an investigation. The only way to completely prove my innocence, because in the Me Too movement, the presumption of innocence has been reversed. If you're accused, you're guilty. This is a slight tangent, but since you brought up the Me Too movement, I noticed that you signed a letter in defense of your colleague at Harvard Law, Ronald Sullivan, who ended up being ousted as a a faculty dean by students who were upset that he was serving as defense counsel for Harvey Weinstein, Mm -hmm. the paradigmatic case in the Me Too era. Um, What is your reaction to his ouster, and and what does it say about Harvard institutionally? Well, you said he was ousted by the students. He was not. He was ousted by the dean of Harvard College. Right, in response to student pressure. Third high-ranking person at Harvard University. It was an outrage, an absolute outrage, goes back to the McCarthy period. You know, if students can get a dean fired saying they feel unsafe in the presence of a lawyer, the next person could say, I feel unsafe in the presence of a Republican. I feel unsafe in the presence of a Jew. I feel unsafe in the presence of a Muslim. I feel unsafe in the presence of a Red Sox 
fan or a Yankee fan. I mean, this is the new mantra of the new McCarthyism. I feel unsafe. First of all, it's a lie. These students don't feel unsafe. They are lying. If they said it under oath, they'd go to jail for perjury. They are lying through their teeth. They don't feel unsafe. They just mouth those words because they know those words will result in them getting their way. And the university should never have given in to these students. In fact, I think the students should probably be disciplined for lying and saying they feel unsafe. They didn't feel unsafe when Ron Sullivan was defending a double murderer who had been convicted of murder. They didn't feel unsafe when he defended other people charged with horrible, horrible crimes. And they feel unsafe when he's defending Harvey Weinstein. It's just a lie. And any dean who believes that nonsense uh, should not be holding the position as dean. The dean should have used this occasion as an educational moment to teach students about the need for representation about John Adams and how he represented the people who were accused of the Boston Massacre. If these students had their way, John Adams wouldn't have been allowed to write the Declaration of Independence, and he wouldn't have been allowed to run for president of the United States. These students have to learn something about due process and constitutional law. These are the same students who don't want free speech on campus except free speech for me, but not for thee. They don't want due process, only due process for me, but not for thee. One of the things I regret about having retired from Harvard five years ago is I'm not there to fight the good fight against these repressive, they call themselves progressive, repressive Stalinists who want to have it their way, who want to end free speech and due process and think they have a monopoly on truth with a capital T. Well, they don't. A university is a place to learn. A university is a place to hear all sides of an issue. And professors of law should be out there representing the most despised and unpopular criminals because they have tenure. And that's what I did for my 50 years at Harvard. I took the most unpopular cases because I knew, at least I thought back then, I couldn't be fired. Who knows today whether I could still represent despised criminals, whether it be O.J. Simpson or Klaus von Bülow or other people like that, and still maintain my job. Harvard should be ashamed of itself for what it did. And it's the leading university in the country. And when it does something like that, it establishes a precedent that will be followed by other universities. And it will hurt due process, the rule of law, and the constitutional right of counsel. Right. I didn't mean to suggest that the students themselves literally ousted Sullivan. No, I just said yeah. that they capitulate, that the administrators capitulated to the students' demands. Exactly and actually, right. Your colleague, Randall Kennedy, wrote a, a column in the New York Times a number a few weeks ago where he said right. that it was this was the biggest embarrassment he's ever witnessed over the course of his decades at Harvard. Obviously, he's a good he's a friend of of Sullivan's. Yeah. But he made the same point about you did. I mean, what what's to stop students from claiming that they're unsafe if they're a Catholic and they have an a- atheist faculty dean? Um, right. No, no, of course. Look, I wrote uh, a piece the day before Randy uh, did. We basically made the same points, uh, and I commend him for uh, having written it. I will continue to write about this and rail against Harvard for having uh, done this. I hope Harvard reconsiders and uh, reappoints him as as dean. Uh, Only that way could they undo the harm that they've uh, done. So uh, I'm I'm in complete sync with uh, Randy Kenny and what he said. Okay, back, back to Mueller. One, one thing that also got my attention in Mueller's statement was that he declared it, quote, un- unconstitutional for the president to be charged with a crime while the president is in office. That was Mueller opining that it would have been unconstitutional for him to charge Trump with crimes, and therefore he viewed it as not an option to do so. But that's not settled law. That's the product of one Office of Legal Counsel memo that is sitting somewhere in the Justice Department, which has never mm-hmm. been tested in the courts. And which another of your colleagues at Harvard, Andrew Crespo, wrote a long essay in 2017 for Lawfare, arguing that that memo was in fact not binding on Mueller. So that seems like yet another cop out on Mueller's part. Well, I think Mueller was right in the end. I think the Constitution does prevent a president from being indicted or or prosecuted. If you look at the structure of the Constitution and the words of the Constitution, It suggests that a president can be prosecuted after he is impeached and removed from office. So I think the better constitutional argument is in favor of what Mueller said. But you're right, it's not settled law. (coughs) And the Justice Department Office of Legal Counsel um, is advisory and could be changed tomorrow. I do think it's binding on the special counsel. I think when the special counsel operates within the Justice Department, he or she is bound by the rules of the Justice Department. You don't get more power 
since you're appointed by the Justice Department to operate a special counsel than you would have if you were a line prosecutor. So I disagree with my colleague on that. But I do think it's not a settled issue. And I do think Mueller used it as an excuse. He apparently told Barr twice, I'm informed, and it's been reported that his decision not to suggest prosecuting the president for obstruction was not at all influenced by his being precluded precluded from charging him with a crime, that he did that on independent grounds. But now apparently he's either changed his mind or decided to use that as a justification or excuse. I don't think this was Mueller's finest hour. I think Mueller's finest hours were when he was completely silent and quiet. Every time he speaks, whether through the report or independently, I think he diminishes his credibility. He diminished his credibility by refusing to come to a firm conclusion about obstruction in the report, and then he diminished his credibility by going beyond the scope of what he's entitled to say when he said that if there had been clear evidence of innocence, he would have said so. Help me understand the logic here, because if Mueller is claiming, and you also agree, that he would have been prohibited from bringing charges— how could he then have reached a conclusion about the prosecu- prosecutability of any given charge? No, I think you can do that. I don't think that's logically inconsistent. You can say that had he not been the president, he would have committed acts that constitute uh, a crime. But my question really is the one I posed earlier. If a special counsel has no jurisdiction to prosecute a sitting president, What role does he have? Prosecutors are only supposed to decide whether or not to prosecute. And if that's off the table, why did we have a special prosecutor? Why didn't we instead have an independent, objective, nonpartisan commission to assess and evaluate all the evidence, produce a public report, hear all sides of the issue in public, and provide information how to prevent this in the future? That's what should have happened. I called for that from day one. The appointment of a special counsel in this case was a fundamental mistake. I hope it's never repeated. I would like to see Congress pass legislation prohibiting the Justice Department from appointing special counsel. And if they do appoint special counsel, prohibiting special counsel from issuing public reports if they don't indict. If they do indict, also not issuing special reports. So um, I think the whole situation is, is, is inconsistent with the rule of law and our constitutional system. Another comment Mueller made struck me as quite arrogant. And tell me if you agree. He said, quote, the report is my testimony, essentially implying that he desired not to testify before Congress. Well, it's not up to him whether he testified before Congress and perhaps members of Congress, whether Republican or Democrat, have additional queries for him that would go beyond whatever is contained in the report. So I thought it was almost Mm -hmm. hubris on his part to insist that he's somehow above the processes of congressional inquiry. Well, he's not quite clearly reminds me of a story in the Talmud about a rabbi is asking God what he meant by a certain thing in the Bible, and God said, I meant what I said. That's it. I'm not going to say anything further. That's God. Okay. Um, Mueller is not God, and obviously no one is above the law, and he has the obligation to respond to a congressional subpoena. Now, he can refuse to answer questions based on privileges that prosecutors may have, but those privileges, for example, would include not expressing a, a personal view about guilt or innocence for somebody that they decided not to prosecute. And he's already waived that when he made that statement yesterday. So I do think it showed a degree of, of arrogance. I hope he will be called. I hope he'll be asked several questions. One, why did he not come to any conclusion when it came to obstruction? Uh, two, um, what he meant by that statement? Why did he put his thumb or his elbow on the scale when it came to obstruction of uh, justice? And I think three... Why he, what was the criteria for hiring people to work on this investigation? I mean, I don't know the truth of this, but I hear from published reports that um, several of the people who were hired uh, were very strong Clinton supporters. One went to a party to celebrate Clinton's victory. By the way, I had a party in my house to celebrate Clinton's victory. It ended sadly. Um, Je- but Jeannie I wasn't Reed, one of the lead prosecutors, was, represented Hillary Clinton in a lawsuit pertaining to yeah. her private email server. I would think that that would be a disqualifying factor. And I would think that uh, Mueller could be asked why he, didn't, why he wasn't more sensitive 
to political partisanship. I know what his answer will be. Oh, I hire just the best prosecutors. I can't ask him whether they're Democrats or Republicans. Well, you can try to bring about some balance if you want to have credibility of your report. Uh, and just make sure you don't have people on the report who have expressed strong, strong partisan views. Um, they, you know, Mueller did fire several of the people. Uh, I can't remember if it was Mueller. I think it was Mueller, but I'm not positive. It was. Mueller, uh, Mueller fired FBI Strzok agents. and Page. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, when he found out that they were so partisan, and yet he kept other people who were, it seems to me, equally partisan, although maybe they kept their partisanship a little bit more discreet. Then, uh, then struck and Page kept theirs. Yeah, my my reaction when watching that statement yesterday was that Mueller, in essence, was rendering a political statement, um, and you seem to come to a similar conclusion in your piece because I don't see how the statement could be read in any other way than Mueller encouraging, as explicitly as he can, given the limitations of his position. The House to initiate impeachment proceedings. He said, quote, well, he the went, Constitution yeah, yeah. requires a process other than the criminal justice system right. to formally accuse a president of wrongdoing. What other process is there but impeachment? Absolutely. That's what he meant. And he, you know, I predicted before the Mueller report came out, I predicted this publicly. And of course, people criticized me for it. I said the report would be devastating in its content against Trump, but that it would not charge the president with any uh, crimes and that it would provide a roadmap for impeachment in Congress. I think I was right about all three of those things. And I think I've been right from day one in my predictions. And I think the folks on CNN have been wrong about every prediction they've made. And um, I think people should be held accountable in the court of public opinion for predictions they make when they are pundits on television, if their predictions turn out wrong, and they should be credited if the predictions turned out right. But we have no accountability for pundits on television. <laughs> Right. Um, so just, so just, so just, just as an exercise, do you think now, now that the, there's a, there's an uh, ineluctable march toward impeachment in the House, we have m multiple chairmen of committees in the House endorsing impeachment just over the past 24 hours. Uh, m most of the, m many of the big name presidential candidates endorse impeachment. My view is that we do seem to be he heading intractably, at least toward the initiation of impeachment mm -hmm. proceedings, and I don't know how Pelosi resists that for long. Well, I'm a liberal Democrat. I want to see the Democrats win, and as the result of that, I don't want to see them go down the rabbit hole of impeachment. That is a guarantee loser if they do that. Um, look, there's only one person running for president of the United States on the Democratic side now, and that's, um, that's uh, Biden, Joe Biden. Everybody else is just running for the Democratic nomination. Uh, they're not running for president. They are making statements that would preclude them from ever winning a national election. Um, but they just want to win the nomination. I think Biden is trying to actually become president. And if you want to win the nomination today as a Democrat, you have to show you're further left than everybody else. And that's a prescription for winning the nomination, but for losing the election. And I think that's where the Democrats are heading these days. Is it not feasible, though, that a protracted impeachment proceeding in which Trump's, you know, behavioral excesses are put at the front of mind in the public consciousness and his potential criminality is discussed day after day? Isn't it possible that that could redound to his electoral disadvantage and perhaps even inflame and energize the Democratic Party's base? I know that this is all speculative, but it does seem to me that Trump and you know, Trump supporters and maybe even Trump himself are a little too overconfident about this somehow being a boon to him. Mm -hmm. No, they shouldn't be overconfident. They should look to what happened in Israel, where you have Benjamin Netanyahu, who is under investigation. And uh, in the most recent election, his party got 35 seats and the opposition got 35 seats, though he had more parties on his side of the right wing coalition than the other side. But he wasn't able to form a coalition. Now they're going to new elections and the new elections will take place just at about the same time that his hearing occurs as to whether he gets indicted or not. So it's always speculative when you have a leader. And I don't want to compare Trump and Netanyahu. They're very, very, very different people. And the allegations against them are very, very different. But that's the only analogy that comes to mind right now. And so I think you're right. It is speculative as to what impact an investigation, an impeachment investigation, would have on a general election. But I think that if you look at Clinton, and I think you see that 
in the end, Clinton's popularity numbers went up considerably um, after he um, uh, was impeached unsuccessfully. But toward Clinton, removal. Clinton was impeached after he was reelected. So there's a different right. set of But his numbers went up anyway. I agree with you. Look, there's no and there's no comparison between the two kinds of cases. Uh, what Clinton was charged with was a low crime, not a high crime. He was charged with a personal uh, failure, uh, but not something that I- impacted on his uh, holding of office. Um, whereas, you know, the Trump investigation was directed at many things, um, including his own election, although the Mueller report concluded that there was no evidence of any improper collusion. And there was no issue. I mean, there was no question of you know, treason wasn't being bandied about as a term during the Clinton impeachment. Well, so the gravity the now just seems different. Well, the treason is, is a laughable offense as related to President Trump. You just have to read the Constitution. The Constitution, the only crime defined in the Constitution is treason, and it defines it with great specificity. And it's not even a close question as to whether anything alleged against the president would constitute treason. So that's just a metaphor that's being used by people who haven't read the Constitution or who have read it and are purposely abusing its language for partisan political purposes. Are you uh, supporting Joe Biden? Are you going to endorse a candidate in the Democratic I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait. I like Joe Biden. Uh, I've known him for years and years. I first met him through um, Ted Kennedy, uh, who I was a very close friend with and, and supporter of. And so I've known Joe for a long, long, long time. And I like him very much. I think he would be a very strong candidate. But I'm not endorsing anybody at this point. I want to see what the field looks like. I want to see how it uh, winnows down. And, uh, you know, I hope I'll be able to support a liberal Democrat where I would have trouble is with a radical hard left Democrat. Um, And I I hope the Democrats are smart enough not to nominate a person like the three women who recently elected to Congress who could win in their small districts, but could never win a statewide election and couldn't even win three states in a national election. The Democrats have made that mistake in the past when they nominated some terrific, terrific candidates, uh, Mike Dukakis, McGovern, um, um, and uh, Mondale. And I think between the three of them, they won 10 states, if I'm not mistaken, something like that. Um, Democrats cannot compete from the left, and they have to compete from the center. And I think Joe Biden is as close to a centrist. I hope he doesn't blow that by trying to move harder to the left in order to win the nomination. That would be a mistake. I know you don't have much of an affinity ideologically with Bernie Sanders, but would it give you any contentment or, or, or happiness to see a major party nominate for the first time a Jewish candidate? I would vote against him. I would campaign against him. I would contribute against him. I would do everything in my power to see him defeated uh, for one reason. Uh, he has actively supported an anti-Semite namely Jeremy Corbyn. He went over to campaign for Jeremy Corbyn. And anybody who campaigns or supports Jeremy Corbyn is not somebody who will ever, under any circumstances, get my vote. But but, but the fact of Sanders being Jewish wouldn't be a benefit in your mind? Or is that that an identity-based thing that you're not interested in? I I would never vote for anybody based on their religion, ethnicity, race, or gender. Um, uh, And... um, I would hate to see the first Jewish candidate for president be somebody who supports British anti-Semitism. That would really put new meaning to self-hating Jew. Uh, I would much prefer to see a Muslim, a Christian, an atheist, anybody else other than a Jew like Sanders who uh, is willing to support uh, um, somebody like Corbyn. Look, I grew up with Bernie Sanders and many people like him in Brooklyn. And they were all a bunch of, you know, red diaper babies who really saw the glory of communism and and the hard left and socialism. And then what does Bernie Sanders do? He wants to bring about racial equality in America. So he moves to Vermont, the least racially integrated state in the entire United States, and operates out out of there. So I have very little good to say about, uh, about Sanders. I think he hurt terribly the Clinton nomination. I think Clinton might very well be president, if not for Bernie Sanders today. So don't ask me to say anything nice about Bernie Sanders. Look, uh, I, I'm not going to say anything nice about Noam Chomsky just because he's Jewish or Norman Finkelstein because he's Jewish. So don't expect me to say anything nice about Bernie Sanders because he's uh, was born to a Jewish family. Um, I just don't respect him. I don't admire him and I don't support his politics. And I despise his going over and uh, supporting 
a Jeremy Corbyn, who was the most anti-Semitic person in the world today in public life, in the Western world today in public life, and who has a chance of becoming the prime minister of America's greatest ally. That would be such a disaster for the Jewish people, such a disaster for Israel, that anybody like Sanders who helps that happen is somebody who has to count me as an enemy. Okay, well, for the record, I, I strongly disagree with your portrayal of Corbin and Sanders, but that's a different subject. Um, we can go, we can have another podcast on that. No <laughs> yeah, that would be fascinating, okay. actually. And I, I know you have to go, but just one final question. Um, there was a report in the New York Times, uh, where, or rather an interview with Michael Wolff in the New York Times today, where he's publishing a new book. He seems to be something of a fabulist, and he, he claims in the book that you were offered a massive, uh, or you demanded a retainer from President yeah. Trump to provide him with legal services, like, is, and, you, and you denied that as being true. What could have possibly been the basis for that claim, as far as you can tell? Well, I first heard that um, false statement from David Boyes, a lawyer in New York, who apparently was telling people that it's totally false, totally categorically false. In fact, I've just written to my lawyers seeing whether it's defamatory. And if it is defamatory, I fully intend to sue Wolf. He never checked with me. He never asked me. He can't possibly have a source for that because it never happened. I never, ever had a conversation with President Trump involving retainers, involving official legal representation, nothing like that. I've made my position clear from the very beginning. I am not a Trump supporter. I want to defend as an independent person Trump's civil liberties, the way I defend everybody else's civil liberties, and the idea that I would ask for a million dollar retainer to represent Donald Trump is just preposterous. It's a lie. It's a made up story. And if that's the level of credibility of this book, nobody should believe a single word in it. And as I say, I've contacted my lawyers to see if the statement itself is defamatory. And if it is, I will sue him and he will not be able to defend it because there can't be a source for a statement that never happened. To be clear, did you offer to provide legal services to Trump through any kind of intermediary? or Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Never under any circumstances, period, without any equivocation, without any, um, uh, any anything other than absolutely no. Absolutely no. Okay. Well, and I, I know never you have to... for any kind of a retainer. It's just totally false. Okay. Well, we shall see how that plays out. Uh, I know you have well, to go. Play I... out. If it, 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 it may play out in court, um, I would expect that uh, Wolf would withdraw it. I would challenge him to name a source or to even state that he has a source because he couldn't possibly have a source for this. Um, he describes a dinner meeting at which the dinner meeting is correct. I was invited to the White House to talk about the Middle East peace plan. I went, had dinner with the president and a handful of other people. Those are the only people who are at the meeting, and I'm sure they will all swear under oath that no such conversation ever occurred. Okay. Well, uh, thank you again for spending some time. Oh, sure. You have to go, um, and maybe we'll do it again at a later date. Sure. Thanks. Be well. All right. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Okay. There you have it. Your feedback, as always, is valued. Also valued would be your contributions via PayPal or Patreon. Links are in the description box if you're watching this on YouTube. If you're listening via podcast, you can find it easily by clicking on the Patreon link. And remember to subscribe on YouTube. Subscribe to the podcast through iTunes or Stitcher. And I will talk to you later.